Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash toahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-w-a-h-i-d-o. You can also join the YouTube channel directly at either a dollar a month or five dollars a month. Today, our special guest is Lika Diakon Tasfa Mikael, also known as Rowan Williams. Welcome to the program, brother. Thank you, Deacon uh, Hinog. Yeah, yeah, glad to be with you today. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, the podcast, so uh, yeah, very happy to be with you today. Thank you so much. But I'm a namasag ganalen, and I I thought we would start on a kind of biographical note. I w- I would think that a number of my audience knows who you are because you've been at this for quite a while. Um, I'm sure longer than me. Um, and and I've been at it for a while now too. So, um, but there are certainly going to be people who don't know. So you'll forgive me if if I have you repeating things that you've said on on other programs you've been on. But um, we'll we'll try to have our unique aspects as as well. How how did you come to be a deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church? How did how did you find this gem? Because I I want to imagine or uh, that that you weren't born uh, in the church. Of course, you were born again in the church. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, I was born again in the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, so yeah, my um, my story in in brief. I mean, um, you can you can hurry me along if uh, you know uh, I, I get into some um, side points and it's not so interesting. But um, you know, I was raised um, in a an agnostic family. I mean. Um, I'd say, you know, my parents were um, agnostic um, Anglicans, you know, so um, church was really just a kind of um, cultural um, thing that they did rather than an expression of um, faith or belief and a thing along those lines. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're talking about going to, to church, um, you know, Christmas once a year. That's that's really it. And then, you know, we had religious assembly, but very much yeah, Church of England um, as the culture was uh, more predominantly, uh, you know, um, uh, at that time during the 1980s. So I grew up in that environment, you know, there was no mention of God or uh, that kind of thing, uh, scripture or related matters at home uh, growing up. Um, It was really when I, um, you know, got to to secondary school or, you know, high school um, for the uh, American audience that um, I, I began to, you know, uh delve a little deeper you know we have a uh, religious education so sort of um learning about um other faiths as well you know religious education is generally a, a multi-faith kind of um subject that we take at secondary school um and um you know i got um very interested in in the rastafari movement um at uh, that age and also the uh, the the um community or the um people that um, I was socializing with at that time also um, really uh, kind of inspired me to um, to follow in that uh, in that track and um, yeah it was it was uh, due to that that um, you know I um, I got into the, the Rastafari movement and not just um, any kind of Rastafari but a specific uh, house or mansion within the Rastafari movement, which is uh, known as the Bobo Shanti House. Um, um, so yeah, kind of. Um, I, I, I'm familiar with that one. That one um, is a little bit more priestly than some of the others, right? Because uh, some of the, some of the people kind of uh, who assess the movement think of it as one blob, or you know, some people might think of Christianity in that way too, if they don't know the the particulars. But right. yeah, could could you say a little bit about how this house is is different? Because I've I've met people from Bobo Shanti as well as from the twelve tribes, and I've noticed differences just between those two. And I'm sure there are plenty of houses that even I don't know about. Yeah, well, I mean the the three houses are the um, the main ones, you know. So Bobo Shanti, uh, Nyabingi, and twelve tribes of Israel. Um, the Ethiopian World Federation is not really a house because you know it's it's really a kind of um, I would say black uh, nationalist um, organization. So you can be you know Seventh Day Adventist and be a you know member of the World Tri- World uh, World Ethiopian World Federation rather. 
Uh, but yeah, to get back to your question about the, the Bubba Shanti House, yes, uh, it's more priestly. So the um, initiated members are called prophets and priests, right? Uh, the leader um, is or was uh, uh, King Emmanuel. And um, King Emmanuel, Charles Edwards, um, you know, the, the Bubba Shanti would say, you know, uh, nobody knows who his parents were, but, you know, he... Uh, he uh, arrived on the scene, let's say the Nyabingi scene in the um, early part of the 20th century and uh, led a you know, significant uh, movement and it was in the Rastafara movement itself. So, um, you know, he led um, a group of um, Bobo to, um, you know, establish their own camp, firstly around uh, Kingston and uh, later on, you know, not too far, about 10 miles away from, from Kingston in uh, what's known as uh, Bull Bay. So it's a kind of monastic, in a sense, a mon monastic kind of uh, settlement in the hills. And it's, you know, there's continually service, you know, night and day throughout the uh, the day, uh, reading Psalms and then chanting through the night certain times of the year. Uh, so it's very liturgical um, in its expression. And, you know, they're, they're also known for being quite, um, uh extreme in some senses you know so it's a black supremacy uh movement so um black supremacy in, in righteousness of salvation is um is one of the uh mantras if you like one of the um um points that they really emphasize so you could say that you know went from um black supremacy to orthodox christianity but uh you know that's the, the bobo shanti um order in 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 a nutshell is is yes yeah, it's kind of um remove from society so they really don't want to be mixed up or polluted by babylon although you know uh many of the members travel into um the city every week you know uh especially to sell brooms they're known for selling brooms and you know their self-reliance they they make the brooms there the um the camp and and they go out to sell them so it's it's very much you know self-reliance and then as i say the liturgical cycle um of the uh, the day and the week um as well the sabbath is also very important and repatriation is 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 really one of the um points that they they highlight so um to know, shashamani uh, well shashamani um yes <laughs> but um yeah I, I, I just know that the the king had given a plot of land to um i i guess anyone who had wanted to repatriate at that at the time right that's right yeah uh, but this also yeah goes back to um the point that i made that with them being viewed as a little more extreme in that they don't um like sort of mixing with uh the other groups to some extent you know they have their own um doctrine and so forth and you know they like to keep that pure as it were and um, Re reminiscent of the the dead sea scrolls community the quran community the uh, yes. the Essenes, where they would be categorized as jews at the time but you know they set themselves kind of apart with their own prayer protocol and, and everything else yes yeah no, that's an interesting comparison um so yeah i mean uh, the focus was always um Addis, but um, uh, and also there was a, a mission sent to Nigeria and the Ghana, um, you know, in, in the time of uh, King Emmanuel. I think uh, in, you're talking in the, the early 70s. Um, so, um, yeah, the um, the, the Bobo Shanti movement, Bobo Shanti order is, is uh, kind of known for that, you know, uh, slightly being slightly exclusive. Um, and um, uh, Shashamani was something that came into into the picture because of necessity you know because uh they weren't able to really maintain my understanding the the life in in addis uh, during the, the time of the Durga and so forth so they were kind of compelled to you know turn to their brothers and sisters who were living in shashamani i.e the uh you know uh other um rest of the uh, nayabingi and the, the 12 tribes of israel and you know uh non uh uh, conformist, shall we say, or the the, the Rasta who don't um, belong to any particular house. So yeah, it's uh, fascinating. You you know you didn't have just some sort of cursory knowledge of this, and now I'm I'm curious about the the type of educational setting because you know one of my other interests um, 
to an extent, I think we have a few grade schools in Ethiopia, and you might know this better than I do. I've heard of Miskaya Zunan as well as Kudusilase in the capital city, Adisawa, having grade schools attached to it. But I, I have a dream where each diocese, if not every parish, would have you know some sort of micro school where we're educating our children. Um, in the United States, it's very common for various Protestant denominations, but most famously the Roman Catholic Church, to to be having these institutes. And and frankly, even in Ethiopia, I know many people who are are believers who grew up in Adventist churches or in um, R Roman Catholic churches or even Pentecostal because they had these grade schools attached. But it's it has me curious now. You said it was an agnostic Anglican household. I know the Anglican church has, um, I don't know if it was the case in the 80s, this low church and high church services, low church being kind of more evangelical, sometimes maybe even like a charismatic church, whereas high church would be very approximate to orthodox if if the dogmatics you know, itself would would be off. I'm wondering if uh, w which of those settings it was, and then were they were they teaching, for example, Rastafarianism as one of the religions? If so, I would be very surprised and intrigued by by that uh, educational model. Um, yes. So uh, the first question, um, it was uh, certainly low church. What would be, what would uh, be yeah, uh, deemed low church? However, you're not talking about you know. Um, just um, you know, some people coming together in a in a uh, a town hall or a church, you know, in a hall or something. You know, like uh, many evangelicals would, you know, they have no kind of um, uh, particular uh, veneration of the building. You know, it, it's, it's very much you know, uh, lots of um, say images and not really icons, but you know, stained glass, the saints, and you know, that's that's all very much. Um, part of it you know the the ancient buildings go back um you know hundreds of years and um although it's not really high church um you know uh the, the kind of churches that i went to as a child um you know it's still not uh, kind of low evangelical uh almost non-denominational you know in, in a in a sense so um yeah that was uh, that was uh the uh your first question sorry your second one about the, the, the rastafari movement it's yeah, cool. because I'm wondering if you learned about the movement through this sort of, uh, you said, this kind of universalist religion um, that they were teaching, uh, or, or was it kind of your independent inquiry? Well, I'd say both. Um, yeah, it was kind of uh, just the um, the situation in which I found myself. So, the, the you know, um the social network in which i found myself led me to as i say um, be inspired to pursue it um at a, a higher level so you know i was very much interested in, in reading more about it and you know you could go to the library and get books uh, at that time um and yes uh, it was uh, it was actually included in uh, some of the material uh, at, at oh. high school, secondary school. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, there was some kind of uh, rudimentary uh, information that I was provided with at school. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I'd say when you say the kind of universalist religion, I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, they're not, uh, the, the, the schools here are not looking to indoctrinate people in a no, kind of secular no, no. school system. Yeah. Um, although, you know, I did go to, to one um, Christian school, um, Protestant, you know, uh, Church of England school. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not obviously trying to uh, indoctrinate anybody there. They're trying to give you a kind of objective view of, um, you know, the, the, the world religions. Um, mm -hmm. Although the subject itself, religious education, came out of um, uh the uh, the government and the church wanting a christian nation after the war it was established in the 40s okay and then it was only by the 60s that questions started to be asked about other religions you know what about the others and you know there are lots of you know indians and uh <laughs> yeah. other nationalities in the country you know that uh, it shouldn't be just you know us teaching them uh, about the bible and so on so um that's uh, yeah religious education um you know really made me want to uh, dig deeper in, in my reading, and um, that's what I did. And but also, you'd yeah, say the um, experiences, you know, uh, social experiences, um, uh, the kind of networks that, that uh, you know I was uh, involved in, and so on, really gave me the um, the inspiration. You know, like the the kind of cultural 
um, seen during the nineties, you know, was uh, jungle, jungle mu music. Yeah. Before drum and bass was, yeah, jungle. Um, and, you know, it's very much kind of uh, influenced by, yeah, what we call now Bashment dance hall, uh, would say you know raga yeah back in the in the you know in the 90s <laughs> yeah and it, it's that that has become itself um more popular i think over the past uh 10 years or so it in in the sense of i think it was more of a subculture before whereas you see some very mainstream environments now that are um, <laughs> maybe even some people feeling culturally appropriating it but you know that's some of the language that is in use when when something that is a subculture gets you know makes it into the into the mainstream consciousness yep. I, I i'm so fascinated by the way um I, I think you were worried about us going down rabbit holes or an aside i think this whole show the beauty of it is um you know i come in with some sort of big themes and motif thoughts but really i think the organic way in which you learned and got to the place that you are right now is the way I think education happens the best, and and so I'm I'm pursuing even the conversation in that way pedagogically, and um, the traditional school, the Abinet in Ethiopia. It's so fascinating having conversations with, for example, the administrator of my parish, who's a, a monk, a Kwamos, as well as our our bishop, who's also of course uh, a monk, and they told me that as young as ten years old and thirteen years old they left their their families and their home and at, at that point it's not as if the church imposes step one step two step three in terms of curriculum if, if you think about it, if you told it to an educator they would think you're insane but you're giving 10 year olds and 13 year olds 100 percent control over their curriculum now they're not making things up because they're in a in a relatively controlled environment. The environment is prepared for them. The various schools of learning, they have the kini, they have the kadasi, they have the mahalit, the various poetry and chanting schools. Um, but they really get to choose wherever they go. Sometimes they're with somebody for three months. Sometimes they're there for five years and they replace that person. And it's fascinating because without having grown up in that tradition, you emulated it somehow. And I think it's good for us to reflect on this because sometimes we have, you know, uh, pious parents like, uh, like you and I would be, right? And the children aren't able to replicate the piety. And sometimes I, I've seen this happen frequently in the United States. I don't know if it's the same in the UK. And, and so the question is, you know, do do you try to raise them secularishly so they rebel against you and become pious? Uh, because you grew up in a relatively secular home. I grew up in the, in the same environment. My my parents have never consistently gone to church in their life. And I would say, you know, they baptized me. They took me to the major high holidays of the church. But that was really more of like a, a cultural homage. And because uh, I still had grandparents and grand aunts alive that would probably eat them if they didn't do that. Uh, so... Uh, you know, they, they had, if not the fear of God, the fear of older uh, family members that compelled them to, to, to do that. But really, I, I was raised in an agnostic home as well. And so you and I have achieved this level uh, in a sense, uh, if you view it that way, I don't know. If you don't, you can tell me, rebelling against the agnosticism for this organized religion in the 21st century. And so one of the questions I wonder is, you know, if we want to foster people like us, you know, what, how do we approach, um, uh, that medium? I, I don't know if you've thought about it in, in, in raising your kids or in, um, in, in the community that you're working there at Sarhaz Eon. All right. Just pause it for two seconds. I'm going to have a, a, a little drink. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and make it a, a more spontaneous, um, response. But I didn't want to have the, uh, the kind of, um, the fizz of my, um, you